Hello, my name is Rob Rocca, and I want to welcome you to my teaching on a basic hermeneutics. Paul wrote to the young minister Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. He said, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. In other words, Paul's instructing Timothy, saying, hey, Look, if you're going to teach these other people, I want you to handle the word of God correctly. So I want to talk to us today about what that means to handle the word of God correctly, because it's so easy to just look at scripture and read a text. And many people do this devotionally all the time. We just look at scripture, we derive its meaning for ourselves and we say, that's good. Or, But sometimes we might be taking that scripture and using it out of its context or using it out of what its original intent was. And if we're going to teach others, it's very important for us to have a, a method for studying God's word that can help us to derive its accurate meaning. So I want to start by looking at what the definition of hermeneutics is. Let's start with defining hermeneutics. Uh, the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary uh, says this about hermeneutics. It's plural in form, but singular or plural in construction. And it's the study of the method methodological principles of interpretation as of the Bible. It's a method of principle of interpretation. So when we are going to look at something to interpret it, it's methodology for interpreting and most often used uh, in the context we're looking at it as is using it for the text of scripture. You can use it for other texts, other ancient texts, other books. You can apply hermeneutics to a lot of things, but we're going to apply it to scripture today. You know, I said it already, but scripture can be um, easily misread. We can often take things and, you know, we, we come with our own ideas when we come to read the Bible and we can easily read into things that we want to. But if we want to make a teaching out of something, if we want to make a, a life choice out of something, if we're truly desiring to hear what God wants to say to us, it's important for us to understand what scripture, uh, where it was coming from and what it actually means and to study that. You know, there's a couple of rules towards this. The first is called exegesis. Now, exegesis is drawing out the intended meaning from the text. Drawing out the intended meaning from the text. What, when you look at that verse of scripture, what was it originally intended to mean to say to us, to the people that it was originally written to? What's the original meaning? The other is eisegesis. Now, as Pentecostal believers, and I'm coming at this from that Pentecostal perspective, but as Pentecostal believers, we can tend to do this sometimes, and that's called eisegesis. And that's when we read our own meaning into the text. You know, we all come to the Bible. We all come to the Bible with different presuppositions and pre-understandings. We all come from places of, of culture and life and our own experiences, um, things that we've been taught in the community that we come from. And that affects how we look at the Word of God. Let's take a look for a minute at what a presupposition is. A presupposition is a personal bias, filter, perspectives from our culture, our life experience, our community of worshipers or other believers that we bring with us as we look at Scripture. So I might look at Scripture differently as a white American dude from, from, from the Western part of the world, differently than maybe... An Asian guy might look at the Bible from his, his Eastern perspective in the world and the Oriental culture from which they come. Those presuppositions are our life experiences or the way our culture does life or our community interacts is going to affect those very same words that we read on a page. And there's no way that we cannot come to the word of God without some presuppositions. What we can do is discipline ourselves to put our presuppositions aside to derive its actual meaning to all peoples, all people in any part of the globe, not just what you and I want it to be in our part of the globe. The other is our pre-understandings. We all have a pre-understandings. We all come from a different community. This can be a different faith community, a different, uh, can also be a different cultural community, but often a faith community where we have a pre-understanding of certain passages of scripture. We've been taught through the years in Sunday school or church services or in fellowship groups that this scripture means this thing. Or, and maybe we've learned it and often, hopefully we've learned it accurately, but often when we come and we read the word of God, we come with a pre-understanding of maybe what that's already saying. So when we approach God's word and we're trying to derive meaning, we have to take note of our presuppositions and our pre-understandings 
if we're going to determine uh, the accuracy of what we're looking at. Now, there are always dialogue partners in any text. So whenever we come to read a text, there are different people that come into that discussion, maybe hidden people, but they're still there. Let me talk about who some of those dialogue, uh, dialogue partners are. The first is the author. You see, that word, that scripture that we're reading was written by somebody, that somebody who lived in a different time and a different day, had maybe a different type of job, a different language. But that author, he comes, he's part of that dialogue. And we really have to understand his perspective and his intent when he was writing it. The next is the reader, because there are readers all over the world from different places that are reading that same word of God. And so that reader comes into us, also becomes part of the dialogue and what they're deriving as meaning. But with that, there's also the community of the author. Who were the people around the author when he wrote that book? What were, what were they speaking? What were they going through? What was, what was going on in the world around them? And, and what was going on in the church life that they had or the, or the life in the, in the life of Israel if they were from the Old Testament? And what was happening in that community and how was that influencing them? Likewise, there's the reader. The reader then, who that first passage of scripture was written for, as well as the reader now who's reading it. That community of the reader also has an impact in what its intent was at its original writing, as well as its intent for those of us who are reading it at this time. The important thing that we have to realize is that if we focus on the reader, then we're going to start practicing eisegesis or drawing the meaning we want to out of the text. What we have to really look at and understand is the author and the community he was writing to to derive the authorial intent or the author's intent out of what scripture is saying to us. Only there can we first come to derive true meaning. You know, for centuries, there's been this pendulum effect. It's been a pendulum swing in interpreting scripture. And it's kind of gone back and forth between this exegesis and this eisegesis. You know, and the exegesis over here would be like taking this historical critical approach to looking at scripture. That's what, that's what often people call the literal approach to looking at God's word. The culture, the society, um, the, the grammatical structure of what was written and the literal intent of what that was and only interpreting according to that literal intent. And then over here is the ice of Jesus. And this is where we get some of our liberal theology and some of the ideas that come out where people just go to God's word to make it say what they want it to say because it suits their needs. There's great danger actually in both because there's supposed to be a balance. I want to propose that we look at this in a balance, but putting the, that balance leaning on the authorial intent that we should take this approach that original intent if we can't come with that original intent, then we're never going to derive the full meaning of what God wants to say. But we cannot you know, discard what the Spirit of God might be speaking into our lives to draw us into an understanding of what that word says. Keep in mind, however, that the Holy Spirit who inspired the word of God is never going to contradict his original intent. If it's the same one who's inspiring you to come to understand what God's word says, he's not going to contradict what he originally inspired to man. Which brings me to another thought. And that's the thought of the inspiration of scripture and authorial intent. You know, we in the Assemblies of God, we believe that the Bible is the verbal inspir that the in the verbal inspiration of scripture. In other words, the Bible is verbally inspired by God and, and breathed into men those ideas and thoughts that have come forth. And it's the first tenet of our faith. But it's very important for us to realize that we don't believe that God robotically just used those guys to write down the things that they were doing, but that he just, he inspired what they were writing when they were writing it and were speaking to their hearts and anointing them to bring this word that we have and that we use today. This is what the Assemblies actually says about this. It says, the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, are verbally inspired of God and are the revelation of God to man. The infallible, authoritative rule of faith and conduct. There are some scriptures that back that up. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15 to 17. 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17 says, You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. 
All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture. And is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is going wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, Therefore we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. You know, if you look at these two scriptures, you first have the first one is talking to the people of the day in the Bible. And it's re really referring to Old Testament and how that Old Testament was inspired. But Paul also brings it that, that you are receiving the words that we're giving to you now. These apostles who were inspired by the Spirit as they were giving the New Testament, that they were also recognizing that this was the voice of God speaking to mankind. And these things were written down and preserved for all time and put into what we call the canon of Scripture. That's a teaching for a different day. But the canon of Scripture, which is what we believe is the authoritative Word of God. 1 Peter 1, 20 to 21 says, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. In other words, he's saying that God inspired, the Holy Spirit moved upon men to write the word of God in those days to teach and instruct that we would have the voice of God to speak to us today. Now, it's so important that we acknowledge that all scripture comes from God himself. But God used men. He used different people. He used 40 different authors from different walks of life. We had kings and cupbearers. We had shepherds and, and doctors and um, servants and, and, and the priests and all kinds of different people. Some spoke Greek, some spoke Aramaic, some spoke uh, Hebrew, all these different people that God inspired to write the word in three different languages on three different continents, Asia and Africa and Europe in different places over this large span of time. And yet we find this unity in the word of God because God was the, was the true author and inspired that. But he used human authors to write it down. And of course, those human authors, we can see in their writing, we can see their, their, their grammatical structure, we can see their intent, we can see the influence of their day, things that were going on, and not only their lives, but the people they were writing to, which brings us back to that thought we were already talking about, the original authorial intent of what was written. Now, there are three words, three words that I want to mention to us right now that we need to keep in mind whenever we're trying to derive meaning from a text. Those authors all existed in cultural and societal environments. Those authors all wrote to a specific audience. Those authors all had an audience that came from a specific environment or culture. Those authors had a specific intent in their writing, and the authors desired a specific outcome in response to that writing. Thinking of that, there are three words that I want us to look at, that we need to always kind of keep in mind in the back of our mind when we go to interpret the Word of God. These are taken from the book, um, uh, Introduction to Biblical Interpretation by Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard. Actually from page 46 in that book. The first word is locution. Locution, what does locution mean? It is what is spoken or written, the words or sentences in a given statement or discourse. Locution is simply the words that are on that page. The words that are on the page that you go to read. When you pick up the word of God and it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You know, right there, there's, a, there's plenty of meaning and something to derive right there just in that statement. How are those words formed together? What's repeated in those words when it's being said? The locution is simply the stated word that exists right there in front of us. Then there's illocution. You say, what's illocution? It's not a word that we use all the time. But the illocution identifies the intent of the speaker or writer using those specific words. In other words, he might have said these words, but why did he say those words? What was his intent 
in communicating those words? What was he saying in the, in the context of his day and in, in, in his life and, and what was going on in the lives of the people he was speaking to? Because you see, those words had purpose why he wrote them. And not only is it in the intent of what he was trying to convey to his readers, but there was also perlocution. And perlocution is what was that writer's desired outcome? In other words, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, what did he want the Corinthians to do after he said those words? What was the outcome he desired? Uh, for example, um, the Corinthians, one, one of the letters, it was corrective. It was about this man who was, who was um, having an affair with, with his father's wife. And, and Paul was telling them, you, know, you, you need to put this man away for, for a season. You need to correct him because what he's doing is wrong and sinful. He had a desired outcome of what he wanted to see happen by what he intended to write. We have to understand the purpose of what he was saying if we want to get to the real meaning of the words that are written in that passage of Scripture. So locution, what's stated on the page. Illocution, which is um, what was the intent of the writing. And perlocution, what was the desired outcome that the author had when he wrote what he wrote. Now, let's go to biblical context. Because all of this, this locution and illocution, this perlocution, all of this wraps up into context. And I've kind of been mentioning that already. Because you see, when we look at scripture, if we're going to derive meaning and, and come to have a methodology in, in deriving the meaning, we must understand the context in which that scripture was being written. What was the context in in the in, in the chapter now let, let me just say this verses and chapters were not a part of the original construction of scripture did you know that i hope you knew that verses and chapters were not a part of the original construction of scripture and it's easy for a reader to isolate a verse without understanding the context of its meaning when we hear that judas went out and hung himself if we just take that one verse we could take another verse where Jesus says, go, go thou and do likewise. And then we could take those two verses and we could stick them together. Judas went out and hung himself, so go and do likewise. And we could justify, in that moment, committing suicide. But to take both of those scriptures, they don't even, they're not in the same passage. They don't go together. And we don't even understand the context by just saying those verses. They, they don't have meaning. Verses and chapters came afterwards, so we could have a, a, a an easy way to get around the word of God and, and to break it up and to find places easier. But the reality is no verse is an island unto itself. Now, there might be a couple of Psalms or Proverbs that seem somewhat island-esque um, the, in the poetical books, but no verse is really an island unto itself. It's written in a passage of scripture, whether that's a chapter or multiple chapters, because a lot of chapter divisions don't allow for us to... to uh, to flow from one, you know, you might start, you might start in, in 1 Corinthians 1 and the thought is flowing over into 2 and maybe even into 3. And something that's said in maybe verse 23 relates to something that was said in verse 7 and connects the dots. So if you only read verse 7 or verse 23 and you don't bring them together, then you could be missing the whole intent of what was bring, brought forth. So anytime we look at scripture, we have to look at it in context. Context of not just the verse, but, but, but the passage, which could be multiple chapters. And then also in the book, what about the whole writing of what was being recorded? You know, so much of our New Testament are letters. So all those letters have beginnings and ends, and, and, they, and they might change subject in the letters. But sometimes the whole of the letter comes to pull things together at the very end of the letter from what was going out the beginning of the letter and the introduction and the conclusion. We want to make sure that we look at the author's complete writing to bring everything together in context. And even then, it might spill over to other writings that that same author had. Paul might talk on a subject in Galatians that he also talks about in Romans. And the two still bear some meaning because it's still Paul's thought process. So we want to look at the context of, of the passage. We want to look at the context of the book. The, we want to look at the concept, context of the author's writings. And then we even want to look at how that fits in with the overall unity of the Bible. One thing that, that I believe that I have seen uh, mistaken a lot is that people will take Paul's writings about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we find in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. 
and they will take them and, and intermingle them with Luke's teachings about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is being having a spirit-filled life, speaking in other languages, which is the evidence of that. And we have Luke, who's this theologian that's always been treated as just a historical narrative, who writes the, the books of Luke and Acts. And the two are both letters. They could have almost been the epistle of Luke 1 and 2. And they continue with this overarching theme of what it means to be spirit-filled and what that baptism of the Holy Spirit is and how it affected the church. Well, that we take and we apply what Luke's taught over here to what Paul's taught. And if we don't understand their differences, we can't apply the principles that Paul taught when he, when he talked about the, the error of using tongues in church as saying we should never speak in another language because, you know, that, that Luke was talking about because we're talking about two different things. One's the gifts of the Spirit and one is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's a whole different teaching I could do on that, but I'm not going there right now. The reality is when we look at things in a full context, and the context of the different authors, we can then begin to, to get a clearer picture of what was being written to us and its intent so we can derive more accurate meaning. So we have the passage, we have the book of the Bible, we have the author's complete writings, and we have the whole Bible. All of these things are important when we look at biblical context. We also have to keep in mind that when we look at the Bible, and we can interpret the Bible often in light of other biblical passages, that there's meaning for us to, to derive. But a lot of things that, that we do sometimes these days are, are word studies, and we want to look at, well, what does this word say everywhere? Well, just be cautious that you realize that the word that might be interpreted into an English word, or if you're a Spanish word or maybe another language that you might speak, you want to know that it's the same word in the original biblical language. You just want to know that when we are, there's a caution that when we interpret the Bible and we interpret in light of other passages in the Bible, that we are going and looking at original biblical languages to make sure that we're comparing the same words and how they are being used in their context. Okay, so let's move on. We need a method now to approach a text of scripture. Well, now let's move on because I want to talk for a few moments about having a method or a methodology for approaching a text. I want to give credit to Dr. Robert Eby of AGTS Seminary at Evangel University. And uh, because I am uh, taking some of his principles that are just basic principles for interpretation, it's just kind of a, what he actually called a, a clear methodology for interpretation. And I want to share some of those thoughts with you. The first thought is that when we first approach a text, that we need to observe it. What's there? What's on the page, the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, the tone, the mood, how it's constructed. You see, every text of scripture, there's so much just to be gleaned just by reading just what's laying there in front of us. So I want to recommend that that, that we look at it um, whenever you go to a text to read it, reread it, and read it in different uh, translations. Maybe you want to use the message, maybe you want to use the ESV, uh, the New King James, King James, NIV, Find some critical text, New American Standard uh, Bible, some, find some really good accurate translations, find some paraphrases, and just read it just to observe. What? What's, what are these words saying? Recognize, pick up on key words and key thoughts and stuff, and, and even read it out loud. There's something that happens, you know, as a minister, uh, before I preach, I, I go and I'll, I'll, I'll practice through a sermon, and as I'm reading the word out loud, uh, it echoes back to myself, and often it's in those moments that I receive things and see things from all the study that I've put in that I'm like going, boom, that's what I need to share. I need to go in that direction. So there's so much we can observe just by reading and rereading a text, even in different uh, language, in, in different versions. Now, you want to observe things like what's the tone of the text? What are relationships in the text? You know, people like maybe it's Jesus' friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, or Jesus and the disciples, or or Moses talking to Joshua. Um, well, who are the characters? You know, again, we're just talking about different characters. What is the context um, that everything's going forth? And what are key words in the text? Are, is there a word that's being used over and over again to make a point? Um, the grammatical structure, sometimes the, the mood, the tone, the, the grammatics of what's being written um, is, is there for a reason. It's structured for a purpose. Uh, who's the author and who is the recipient? You know, who's writing to whom and why? Um, is someone being quoted? Are they quoting the Old Testament? Are they, um, are they using, are they interpreting the Old Testament or a thought in the New Testament in light of the Old Testament? Is Jesus being quoted? These are all things that we can recognize 
when we observe. And it's good to write down questions. Don't answer them yet. Just let the observation raise up all these questions in our minds of what, maybe what we should do, what we should think about. And, and just, just take notes. Observe, take notes. And then from there, you want to interpret. What does all that mean? I just asked all these questions. Now I'm going to go and answer those questions. Now it's time to go and answer the questions that I've asked. And it's time to dig for information. I mean, dig. It's time to go digging. You know, it's so important. Don't just, you know, sometimes we just scratch. You ever heard the term scratch the surface? Sometimes people just scratch the surface. We read devotionally, we scratch the surface. But when we really want to make a teaching, a doctrine, an understanding, a rule for our life out of something, you need to go past the surface and go down deep. So go and dig in. The good thing is, you know, the Bible was written thousands of years ago. Things were a lot different then than they are now. Some things in human nature are just the same, but a lot of things culturally and, and, and archaeologically and geographically and, and the way things are done, just so different. So we want to understand that. So go digging for the information that we need. And when we dig, get some good tools. Because how many know that, that tools make your job easier? I know when I go to do a project, if, uh, if I'm trying to unscrew a screw with a butter knife, it's frustrating. If I go get myself a Phillips head screwdriver for a Phillips head, it works much better. So consult tools. Let's talk about what some of those tools for the dig might be. Lexicons, commentaries, and not just devotional commentaries, you wanna get critical commentaries. Historical or cultural studies, theological word books, Bible dictionaries, journals, scientific and archaeological discoveries. There might be something on the internet that's dealing with something that just recently happened that we know of in, in science might have just proven something that we know from scripture and we, we want to go and apply that. So you want to go and, and deriving that meaning and dig, dig and see what is the, not just the biblical context, but the whole cultural, scientific, archaeological, geographical context, everything that's going on so we can determine the author's intent and what he wanted to convey to the reader and what he desired the outcome to be. All that, that locution, that illocution, that perlocution, they all come back together in the stage. And then, of course, there's application. How do we apply everything that we've read? You know, when we look at some things that are similar in life, when Paul's talking about uh, husbands and wives or when Jesus says something about marriage or something, some things are just timeless and they're going to connect over the generations. What it meant then is what it still means today. Some things were written in, in culture, like, like things about women being silent in the church or sometimes even cultural ways of dress, that we have to take an overlying principle uh, were they conveying modesty? Were they conveying order? Were they, what were they conveying here? Because it might be the principle of what they were conveying more so than the literal things that is where the true meaning is in those. So when we go to apply things, we want to take, we have to first have an understanding what it meant way back then. And now we want to take it to what, how does it apply to us right now in what we're doing? You know, there's something that I want to say about the author of the Holy Spirit. If the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit and breathed although his, the thoughts and the, and, and the things into the hearts and the minds of the writers. That same Spirit who inspired Scripture then is going to, when he illuminates Scripture to us, he's never going to contradict himself. Does that make sense? When we go to, to make these applications, we want to make sure that the applications are always in line with original intent and meaning because the spirit of God isn't going to say one thing then and change it now. If that were the case, then he's not the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even though culture and society has changed, his principles of his word have not changed. And we can take what was then good for then and, and place it into how that's still good today and how that still applies for us today. And not just for us in America, but for us globally. Because the word of God that knows no cultural boundary. When we understand what it really said to the culture that it was written to, then we can find application for all people in all places. And so make sure that when we're finding that application, you know, here's where, here's where it's important to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. And here's where as Pentecostals, we know that the Holy Spirit brings to life the word of God. But I want to let you know that, the, that what you should find when you're studying the scripture is that the Spirit of God's never going to inspire you to something that's contrary to what he originally said. 
such an important thing to set deep down in our spirit, man. And I know that I found through my study that, that as I go to study, that God just confirms. He just confirms the spirit. You know, I, 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 it, it's what a privilege it is to know that the spirit of God would confirm the word that when I find out, discover original meaning, that it goes right along with what he was inspiring in my heart with, with what might have seemed like ice Jesus, but it really wasn't ice Jesus. It was just the same spirit who breathed it, making it alive today. So make sure that when you apply, that you understand, first of all, that original meaning. These are basics of hermeneutics, that authorial intent, locution, illocution, perlocution. These are, are the basics of finding out what is God's word saying to them, to who it's written to, so we know today what he's saying to us. And from there, we can experience what the word of God says rather than just reading about what the Word of God says. I hope you've enjoyed the study on a basic hermeneutic.